This is Carol from the STS. This is the STS National Database ACSD monthly webinar. It is December 6, 2023. Oops. On the call with me today, we have a nice group from STS. Uh, it's me, Catherine, Jane Hahn, Melinda, and Paul Meehan. And then we have uh, Dr. Uh, Miklos Kortai with us and Dr. David Shaheen should be here shortly because we are ready to get rolling with this beta blocker project. So um, first, before we get into that, we're gonna go over some quick STS updates. The December training manual is posted, so look for that. Harvest 4 reports are going to be coming out um, hopefully mid-January. They'll be a, planning to be a few weeks earlier than they have um, historically been released. So great job by the STS analytics team. Uh, we look forward to having those out um, within the next month or so. Harvest 1 closes on February 23rd. And we'll go through the dates in just a, uh, more dates in just a second. AQO Hot Topics webinar for AQO attendees. The webinar will be tomorrow. We have uh, from 10 to 3 Central. We'll have presentations with a few breaks planned in between. Um, but hope if you joined the um, if you joined us for AQO this year, please an email was sent out with the link for the Hot Topics webinar. And hey, Melinda, what's up with those encrypted emails you've been sending out coming out of the FAQ mailbox? Well, um, I'm actually going to be sending some encrypted emails to persons who I ask op notes from or sensitive information. So I've been getting some questions. Why are you sending me encrypted emails? And I'm like, oh, just because I might be asking you for something that might be sensitive. So not to worry, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just something I'm doing now. And uh, so in case you see it, don't worry about it. It's going to be happening more and more. Oh, and Carol, there's something blocking the screen, like in the uh, corner, like I can't see the rest which, of the world. Which emails, corner? like emails, can't see emails. There's like a big box. There is. I don't have, you know what? I know what that is. Hold on. It's the emoji box. Ah. And uh, unfortunately, I have a hard time. Is that better? No. Dang oh, it. it's gone now. You got it. Whatever it you is did. gone. Okay, yep. somebody sent an emoji. Let's test it out. Make sure I didn't screw anything up. Anybody? There you go. Working. So, okay. Unfortunately, they're not going to fly up. They're just going to show up at the bottom of the screen, but that's still okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, thanks for explaining that, Melinda. We're going on. Important dates. December 6th is today. It's the monthly webinar. Hot Topics webinar tomorrow from 10 to 3 Central. Quality improvement series that was scheduled for December 20th is canceled. Our next quality improvement series webinar will be on January 17th. The beta blocker project is going to go live on January 1st with OR dates January 1st and uh, beyond. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Monthly webinar is on the 7th of February at 2 p.m. Another quality database improvement series is on the 21st of February. And then Harvest One closes uh, February 23rd, 2024. And that will include OR dates through December 31st, 2023. Opt out for that ends on February 27th. Harvest dates for um, 2024 have been posted to the STS website. Um, harvest submission window closes is the uh, second column here with February 23rd listed for harvest one. And then you have your opt out date. It includes procedures performed through and then the report posting. We typically, and I try to scoot these dates down just a little bit. So hopefully it's a little bit more helpful. Um, and of course, being aware of um, U.S. and religious holidays and other ho uh, important holidays that we need to consider in picking dates. Um, we usually see the Harvest One report sometime uh, late March, early April. So I hope that will be right. We should be, it should probably be, I'm sorry, it usually is around early to mid-April. So we should see that report that, uh, around that time. And don't forget the data submission is open continuously except when it close, we have um, the harvest close, 
which occurs at 11.59 p.m. Eastern on the date listed. So if you're in a different time zone, uh, just please be aware that it closes at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. But I know that there are no, nobody's out there who's submitting data the very last hours of harvest close. And if you are, I hope it's because um, it's for the next harvest, not the current harvest. Uh, but please just be aware of the harvest close time of 11 p.m. Eastern on the date listed for harvest submission window close. And um, I see Dr. Shaheen is with us, so I just wanted to welcome um, Dr. Shaheen and Dr. Kurtai. Uh, Dr. Shaheen is at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and he has already presented on the Beta Blocker Working Group. We're just going to uh, ask him to re revisit these slides and um, and then we'll go from there with Dr. Kurtai, and then we're going to go into a data collection form review with this group and the red cap form. So, so doc yes, sir. I I am having internet stability problems. So if uh, if I break up, uh, just proceed. Um, I'm okay. sorry. No, no uh, worries. I'm glad you're able to join, and we have Dr. Kurtai on with us as well. So, um, so why don't be we? That'll be fine. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we get started? Um, and uh, somehow that'll let me know if I'm not coming through. Um, well, thanks everybody for uh, uh, your participation in this uh, project. Uh, as you all know, our cabbage composite score uh, has four uh, domains. Uh, one of which is uh, use of all four of the evidence-based perioperative medications one of which is uh, preoperative beta blockers. Uh, and that is uh, the subject of this uh, ongoing investigation. Next slide, please, Carol. So um, in the uh, 2011 uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines, uh, preoperative beta blockade use was a uh, uh, class uh, one uh, recommendation, <clears throat> excuse me. And it is uh, it has been downgraded to a class two uh, recommendation, but still recommended um, uh, by the ACC and AHA. Uh, I think the downgrading is primarily because the uh, studies upon which uh, the evidence uh, is based uh, for this recommendation go back now several decades and there have not been recent randomized trials nor are there likely to be. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is also uh, a, uh, uh, an NQF uh, and CMS uh, endorsed uh, measure. Uh, the last review was a few years ago, but uh, still still endorsed. Next slide, please. Next slide, Carol. Oh, it went. I'm on rationale for administering beta blocker therapy. Uh, um, uh, ah, there we go. Okay. Um, there uh, have been as well a uh, number of uh, reviews this uh, uh, was a nice one uh, rationale for administering beta blocker therapy uh, preoperatively. Um, next slide, please. Okay. And uh, the European guidelines um, as well um, emphasize the value of preoperative beta blockade, particularly in patients with uh, recent myocardial infarctions, and uh, certainly a large percentage of patients today uh, undergoing cabbage, for example, have come in with um, acute coronary syndromes or um, uh, non-STEMIs. Uh, Carol, are, are these slides showing up clearly on your screen? I, I, they're very blurry online. That's why I'm wondering. Yeah, they are. Um, it says Jennifer's having blurry slides, but mine are clear on my screen. Anybody else having? My screen is clear, but I'm watching this on my on my iPhone. So um, maybe this is different the way it comes across on a regular computer screen. Mine's clear. I'm on computer. Okay. Well, uh, I will uh, 
Uh, let's, let's see about this one. Yep. All right. So here's the problem, and it, it's not a new problem. Uh, we've been dealing with this now for uh, really eight or nine years. There have been uh, sporadic um, studies, uh, actually many of them coming from our database, that have uh, raised questions about the value of preoperative beta blockade. Uh, some of them have shown uh, no benefit. Uh, that's suddenly cleared up. Some of them have shown uh, even paradoxical um, worsening of the rates of postoperative atrial fibrillation in uh, patients receiving preoperative beta blockade. Um, and I've just shown some of the representative ones here. Uh, a number of them have come out of uh, uh, the group in Texas. Um, and they're they're very nice studies. I don't I, I have no uh, major criticisms. I'll mention one or two uh, methodologic uh, features, but I think I think with the data they had available, uh, they did the best they could. And the results are counterintuitive. Um, and uh, frustrating. And I think we have a responsibility uh, as the leaders of various quality efforts within STS um, to investigate this further because if we are going to incentivize the use of preoperative beta blockade, we need to be sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, it, it is, as I mentioned previously, still recommended by both the uh, US and European guidelines. So I think we're we're in uh, we're very safe in continuing to recommend their use while we do some further investigations. I think we can make a significant contribution to the, the science and understanding of beta blockade and uh, heart surgery uh, by doing what I'm going to talk about in just a second. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. And That's there good. have been a number of... Uh, Sort of reviews and commentaries on these various papers, which uh, uh, I have all of these, and I could make them make them available to you if you just email me. One of them actually is, is one that I wrote. Um, next slide, please. I I switched. That Carol, slide. next slide. Oh, I did. Can you see it? An ongoing conundrum. Carol? Can you hear me? Now I can. There okay. we go. Okay. So here's here's the the problem we're facing. Still have US and uh, European support for continuing this practice. Uh, the many of the original randomized trials upon which uh, these guidelines are based are dated. They're unlikely to ever be repeated. Uh, several studies that I've shown you from uh, our database raise questions about efficacy um, and in some cases even worsening of risk. Um, there are, however, some glaring deficiencies in some of these studies, such as information about amiodarone. Uh, some of the uh, beta blocker studies, particularly a Dr. Brinkman's study in JAMA Internal Medicine, have excluded recent MI patients, and those are the patients who may benefit most from preoperative beta blockade. Uh, so in response to, to this conundrum, uh, we have been uh, working uh, for several years now uh, on trying to better understand uh, this issue. Uh, we had representatives from the um, uh, task Force on Quality Initiatives from the Adult Cardiac Surgery Database, QMTF, and the Society of Cardiovascular uh, Anesthesiologists. Um, we've also done some preliminary studies uh, uh, using uh, STS data and uh, our research center with Dr. Habib. And it appears that there are actually uh, several different groups of hospitals into which the data fall. There are some hospitals using preoperative beta blockade where it seems to be efficacious. There are others where it doesn't seem to have much effect one way or the other. And then there's a group of hospitals where uh, 
the use of preoperative beta blockade actually seems to be associated with worse outcomes. And that, of course, makes very little sense. Uh, but we have some hypotheses about what might drive uh, these findings. Next slide, please. Okay, I switched slides. Can you see it? Now I've got it. Okay. Is so, it clear? Is it yeah, clear yet? Okay, good. Clear. Thank God. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what are some potential explanations um, for, for what we're seeing? Um, there certainly has been a, a change in the patient case mix and the conduct of cardiac surgery since the time when the original randomized trials were performed. Uh, you know, I think in general, uh, temperatures uh, uh, not going nearly as low as uh, we used to do 20 years ago. Uh, myocardial protection uh, is far superior. Um, uh, but even in those original randomized trials, uh, there was tremendous variation in the specific beta blocker that was used, the dosage, the exact timing of administration. Um, Amiodarone, as many of you realize, is now often used in current practice uh, by programs. Uh, and I think they're viewing it as an alternative prophylactic agent. Uh, and uh, this, this could explain some of the um, uh, sort of ironic uh, counterintuitive results in some of the studies, uh, because the patients, in fact, that were not on beta blocker may actually have been on amio. Uh, is it likely that the pathophysiology and pharmacology of, of atrial fibrillation and beta blocker has changed? Uh, we think that's very unlikely, and we've actually, uh, through Dr. Kurtai, uh, uh, who's on the call, we have actually uh, uh, had an uh, electrophysiologist with a particular interest in this area uh, give us his opinion on this, and, and he did not think so. There's certainly no reason that anybody can think of why a beta blocker, for example, should increase the post-operative incidence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we think there's a couple of likely explanations for these findings. Uh, one is that we simply don't have sufficiently granular data. Uh, we've made a conscious effort in recent years to reduce the amount of data that, that we collect to make uh, make it easier to fill out the data forms, but some critical uh, things have sort of fallen by the wayside. Um, so that I, I think there are probably unmeasured confounders uh, that are distorting these findings. And then we think it's very, very likely uh, that programs vary substantially in how they administer preoperative beta blockade. Um, and we're not really capturing that in detail. I think many have sort of a check the box mentality, uh, you know, we give a little squirt of uh, IV esmolol, uh, perhaps in the operating room just before surgery. Uh, and, and that checks the box, uh, but it, it's very, very unlikely to have any uh, positive uh, impact on the patient could actually harm the patient. So that's, uh, I think, a major issue. Uh, many preoperative patients should already be on chronic beta blocker therapy if they were known to have coronary disease. Uh, but what we don't know is how many uh, beta uh, uh, blocker naive patients, uh, patients who have never received beta blockers before, how many of them actually receive optimal titrated uh, preoperative beta blockade? And then just the last slide, please. Did it go? Carol. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Ah, there we go. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, so what we need is some additional study, additional data um, with a, a survey of actual practice and maybe ultimately a registry randomized trial. We may need to update uh, ultimately the uh, adult cardiac surgery database to have more granular beta blocker administration information. Um, uh, we could uh, ultimately modify or more precisely beta, uh, specify the preoperative beta blocker requirement within the cabbage composite medication bundle. Uh, but all those things 
have to be done with extreme caution. We don't want to convey the message that preoperative beta blockade is unwarranted because uh, that's really inconsistent with our understanding of uh, pharmacology, uh, physiology, and with the current uh, ACCHA and uh, European guidelines. So what are the next steps? We need more data. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, Carol and uh, Nicholas and others uh, will now describe what we plan to do going forward to collect the kind of data that we need in order to better analyze and understand uh, preoperative beta blockade. So, okay. and we come back and have questions later. And I apologize if there was, uh, if there were any issues with uh, my internet, uh, uh, but uh, hopefully you can see most of the slides. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor Shahian. And sorry for any issues. I don't know where they were causing. I just checked the weather, and it doesn't even look like there's anything bad really going on, except a little bit on the west coast. So uh, that wasn't it. <laughs> but thank you, uh, thank you for presenting. Of course, uh, always well done. I'm going to hand it over now to Doctor Kurtai. Um, Doctor Kurtai, are you uh, are you there? Yeah, can I'm you, still can here. Can you hear I'm me now? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry in the OR today, so I'm not going to turn on my camera. Um, so my name is Miklush Kurt. I'm a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, and I have been fortunate to member of this task force trying to really find out why there is such a difference in terms of the rate of atrial fibrillation after isolated cavity surgery across um, uh, the kind of the board and, and really trying to sort of tease out um, in a meaningful and pragmatic way why such differences may exist and what are the potential factors or drivers that could explain these differences. So um, after a long kind of discussion and ways of um, trying to really come up the best way to um, tease that information out, um, we decided to uh, design um, a prospective observational survey-based study. And part of that study, uh, we are inviting all SDS adult cardiac surgery database participating sites to voluntarily um, contribute and help us um, in a structured way, collect information, additional information on uh, therapeutic beta blocker administration practices. Next slide, Carol. Um, so basically, um, Carol, would you like me to go through this or you want me to cover this? No, please go ahead. So as I indicated, and as Dr. Shaheen indicated, this is going to be uh, a prospective study that will be started, as Carol indicated, at the beginning of this webinar, January 1st, 2024. And the study is planned to roll for a year for 12 months, ending December 31st, 2024. Um, basically, the participants, as I indicated, going to be uh, all uh, continental United States SDS adult cardiac surgery participating sites, uh, just to really sort of have a consistent and ongoing and um, also giving us the opportunity to, to hopefully maximize the data collection from the individual participating sites. Um, to really help with the process of data collection, we decided to create a rat cap survey form, which is specifically designed to minimize the, uh, the data uh, um, capture um, in terms of the data capture burden that is required for this prospective survey-based study. As I indicated, the duration is going to be for 12 months. Um, and uh, Carol, Dr. Shaheen, and others, we really sort of want to stress this. This is a voluntary for first uh, time uh, cabbage cases. So this is not something that in any way we wish to kind of impose or enforce on participating centers. We understand uh, how much work um, it involves to collect information into the adult cardiac surgery database, but we feel that having that bit of additional information about therapeutic beta blocker uh, administration practices 
could really address some of those key questions that Dr. Shaheen reviewed in his presentation and likely, or some of those are contributive factors why we observed those differences in patients who received preoperative beta blockers and then subsequently did or did not develop positive atrial fibrillation. Next slide. So what are the expected um, outcomes? As Dr. Shaheen and I already uh, alluded to that, really want to see kind of a contemporary uh, practice of uh, perpetual beta blocker administration in patients undergoing isolated, first time isolated cavity surgery. And then subsequently through some um, sophisticated statistical analysis to understand the impact of such practices on the rate of atrial fibrillation, uh, generate data for future measure for reevaluation and approval uh, and finally, really provide uh, up-to-date uh, state-of-the-art evidence uh, for um, revising and updating practice, practice guidelines uh, concerning therapeutic beta blocker use for isolated cavity surgery. Next. Oh, my turn. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Nice review. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sheehan, um, Dr. Kurtai, and I see that Dr. Payon is on. Um, Dr. Payon, did you have anything to add to either uh, presentation, uh, a part of the presentations that we've already received, or um, would you like me to proceed with the data collection form review? Um, you know what? I'm sorry, Carol, I'm, I'm late. Just, just um... I only had two quick comments. One is that the other thing I think is worth noting is that uh, this is not a this is not a, a clinical trial. Uh, it, it's a, a quality improvement initiative, and so there shouldn't be any IRB issues for any one of their centers. Uh, the the only other thing I'll put in, and it might be a little controversial, I suppose, but you know one of the outcomes might be that we find that beta blockers actually aren't beneficial, <laughs> and and the you know and the change in the uh, uh, you know, the, the guidelines uh, w would say that, and then we're no longer collecting it. I don't. I don't think any of expect any of us expect that to be the outcome, but I, I think in full disclosure, that's certainly one of the possibilities. And, and that's really all I uh, have to add at this point. Great, thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor Kale. Okay, I'm going to go over the data collection review, the data collection form review, but first to recap. Uh, remember, this is just a few um, points here, voluntary, like um, everyone has said so far, voluntary. It's not required. If you are participating, we just ask that you please be consistent and enter all the cases that are appropriate for this uh, project. We want to make sure that we're looking at your whole grouping of patients, um, not a selected group from your site. So please, it's the first time cabbage patients um, and if you're participating, please just be consistent in participation. Go live date is with OR dates of January 1st, 2024. So surgery is performed on and after January, 2024. The Red Cat form will be available on January 1st. We're working with vendors to implement this into their software. Uh, we'll have a meeting with them and hopefully early January to get them the data specification, software specifications, and the related um, training manual supplement. So um, those who are able and willing to build it out for sites will, will be doing so. The data collection form will be posted in the next week. I'm hoping to post it um, later this week. I just want to make sure no changes because I don't want to have version control issues. So uh, hopefully we'll, I'll post it by Friday. And that also depends on our marketing availability to get it, get it up on the website. Uh, the training manual will be updated with the supplemental beta blocker fields with January's update. So that will be contained within the January training manual. I think, Melinda, are you planning to post it at the end of the training manual? or um, um, Probably where the temporary fields are currently. Okay. So we'll note, you know, Melinda does a great job with the training manual. She'll definitely make it easy to find along with the link to the red cap uh, form within the training manual. If you have any questions, just please reach out to me or Melinda and we'll, or Catherine, and we'll be able to help you with that. 
and of course we'll be talking about it on most webinars uh, just to you know as reminders and now i think i'm gonna the long-awaited reveal of the data collection form <laughs> all right melinda here we go da -da, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yeah. drum roll please <laughs> 250,000 likes. <laughs> Do you know what movie that's from? Uh, Anybody? Christmas. Uh, <laughs> Good National job. Lampoons. You knew I knew it. <laughs> Good job, Paul. <laughs> National Lampoons Christmas Vacation. Okay, so <laughs> this is the data collection format. I'll show it to you both in this format, which is our, tip, our normal uh, format, and then I'll show you the red cap form and what that looks like. Uh, the red cap form it will be a link in the training manual. All you do is click the link and it'll take you directly to this form and then it'll ask you the following questions. You do not have access to it and we'll address in the training manual if for some reason you make an error or you need a form removed or you accidentally entered in a patient twice. We'll address all those um, who you need to contact for updates to the red cap form because you will not have access to your cases um, to make changes to the cases you enter into the red cap so we'll provide that information in the training manual and we are planning um, to uh, allow sites to have access to their data we just have to figure out how to operationalize that it will likely be on a request for uh, request per request so more to come on that um, like we're only going to run this project for 12 months and um, I shouldn't be any problem to get sites their data. So, but more to come on that. Let's just get started getting the data in. So this is the uh, data collection form. And I'm gonna remove this. So see, that's why we keep it draft until I actually post it. So this is the beta blocker supplemental form. Fields, this isn't my most recent one, unless I'm not seeing how do I see my hidden text, Paul? Go down to, um, go to file, options. Oh Lord, options. Uh, display. There it is. I was yep. able to hide the text, I then I couldn't <laughs> find the text. <laughs> okay, so this is the annotated form. We'll post the annotated form on the website. It includes the, um, the field name here, and then we have the short name and sequence number. This has a separate version, so it will have its a different sequence number for um, these first four fields than what's already collected in the adult cardiac version 4.20. Sequence numbers don't mean a whole lot besides it's just a sequential, a sequential listing of the uh, of the fields. They change between versions. What's really important are the participant IDs or are the participant IDs, are the short names, which for participant ID, it's Partis ID. So these first four fields, participant ID, patient ID, record ID, and date of surgery. Participant ID is your site's five-digit number, uh, either starting with a one or a three. So it's your number that STS assigned to you as a STS adult cardiac participant. Patient ID and record ID, these two are software generated within your vendor software, or if you're a direct data entry user, they'll be uh, populated within the direct data entry form. This is not the medical record number or your, um, any other number used at your hospital to identify the patient. This number is STS generated, generated by your vendors and it's specific it usually starts with a it will start with a v the letter v is in victor and then uh, have a number after that this is the factor that we will be able to link these two fields record and patient id are the two fields that will be able um, most able to link the records from redcap in with the records for my cuvia so it's not phi it's uh, de-identified there's no uh, phi here other than the date of surgery and we'll be using um, these fields so when you go to enter in a patient into your vendor id that patient is assigned 
that's a specific ID specific to your vendor software. That patient ID can have multiple record IDs underneath of it. So each time the patient comes in for a surgery, uh, say they have you know cabbage and then a couple of years later they come back for valve, it would be under the same patient ID and it would be assigned a new record ID for each of those procedures. So the record ID is specific to the procedure being performed on the patient. And then date of surgery. The questions that we are going to ask to start will begin uh, pre-operative beta blockers, a number of home beta blockers. Um, one, one or two beta blockers are not on home beta blockers. The, um, it is possible for patients to be on two. So uh, whatever the patient's on at home, you'll select this. And we have very clear instructions in the training manual about if patients are prescribed medications but not actually taking them, um, how to address these fields. So. Uh, we'll go through that in, a, in another webinar, probably in January, but I think the training manual is pretty clear on these. And then um, depending on the number that you answer, one or two, the corresponding fields to capture the name, the dose in milligrams, the route, and the frequency uh, will populate. If you answered that the patient was on two, then the second set of boxes will open. Most patients are only on one home beta blocker, so you won't see this whole second set. Next set of questions is related to hospital arrival up to 24 hours prior to skin incision time. So skin incision, see why I didn't post it yet? Start time. Uh, so this is the time from the patient arriving at the acute care setting up to 24 hours prior. There are time examples within the data training supplement. Uh, say for an example, a uh, patient arrives on January 1st at 7 p.m. They are going to surgery on January 3rd at 8 a.m. You're only going to collect, so let me, let me write this down for you. Hold on. See if I can get a quick um, blank document here. So they go to surgery on January, or come into the OR, I'm sorry, come into the hospital. I won't use military time just in case, but they come into the hospital on January 1st at 7 p.m. They go to surgery, their skin incision start time is 8 a.m. on January so this is hospital admission time or the time that they were admitted to the acute care facility. And that includes observation patients. It's all very clear in the training manual. You'll just have to read, uh, read that information. January 8th is the skin incision start time. So this question that we're looking at This next set of questions is hospital arrival. We'll just call this hospital arrival. Sorry, I should have used the same wording. Uh, hospital arrival up to 24 hours prior to skin incision start time. So I'm looking from January 1st at 7 p.m. And then I'm going back 24 hours from skin incision start time, which would be January 2nd at 8 a.m. Right, that's gonna be my 24 hours prior to skin incision start time. Oh, I think you need to move the Word document up a little bit. Okay. So that's going to be my January 2nd, 8 a.m. is my 24 hours prior to skin incision start time, right? It's 24 hours prior to the time. So this question is asking the beta blocker given, any beta blockers given between this these times here. Is that clear, Melinda? Anything I need to add? That, that gets the gist across. We do have clear uh, directions about what hospital arrival means and what the first beta blocker is. It's, it's just technically the first scheduled beta blocker, unless it's the only one you get. So the training manual has some really good um, information in it that'll explain things um, to you. Yeah. And then there's a question um, question that came in regarding the patient arrives within 24 hours. So name of first beta blocker given from hospital arrival up to 24. However, the patient 
arrived to the hospital within 24 hours of skin incision start time, you would just capture not given, contraindicated, or unknown. Um, okay, we're going. And then, so the next set, so this is again, hospital arrival up to 24 hours prior to skin incision start time. If the medication, uh, if any of the options are chose, select, you're just going to provide the date and time of the first beta blocker given within that time frame. The next set of questions is specific to that 24 hours preceding skin incision start time. So for the example, for the example I had here, what we're going to look at is, and I'm not going to get super uh, specific with 8 o'clock, 8.01, or anything like that. I'm sure we'll get questions on that. But uh, specifically what we're looking at for this question is the 24 hours prior to, which would be January 2nd, 8 a.m. to January 3rd, 8 a.m., what was given within this time frame, right? So within that time frame, this is that 24 hours prior to OR entry. It's a, a very similar question to, did the patient receive a beta blocker within 24 hours uh, prior to skin incision that we already collect? We're getting a little bit more granular here because this is the important part of the project um, that really uh, needs to be understood much better about what patients are receiving, when and how much. So for that time frame, within 24 hours prior to skin incision start time, we want to know about all of the doses of beta blockers given within that 24 hours, how many doses were given. So you'll need to check the um, MAR, the Medication Administration Reconciliation Sheet. You'll also need to check probably anesthesia or perfusion. But again, you know, make sure you are aware of what the skin incision start time is. So however many doses were given, and then you'll uh, provide the naming, the names of those doses. So the first one is first beta blocker given within 24 hours preceding skin incision start time. What time was it given? Now, if this was the first and only dose given within that 24 hours, we're just going to want to verify that with you again. So we, uh, this is a duplicative question and we're asking it. It's just a verifying question, um, just kind of uh, prompting you to really double check that anesthesia record to make sure nothing else was given right before skin incision start time in the OR. Um, so just you would just answer this question, yes or no. And then if more than one dose was given within the 24 hours, we would like information, um, second dose given, and this should be sequential. So the first dose given would be the first dose within the 24 hours, second dose is the second dose within the 24 hours. And then we get closer to skin incision start time, uh, the third dose and fourth dose given uh, prior, 24 hours prior to skin incision. And we ask the same questions, the time that it was given, the amount in milligrams, and then the route. Yeah. Now, if that pay, if that patient only received one dose of beta blockers within the 24 hours, you're not going to see all these other questions. It's just the uh, first set of questions regarding the first dose. Did you have something to say, Melinda? Sorry. It wasn't me. It wasn't oh, me. Okay. So, Carol, can I just make a, a quick comment? It's yes, gone. Sir. Yes. Um, you know, so we're, we're talking, we're spending a lot of time, we're asking a lot of questions about this you know, last 24 hours or the 24 hours immediately preceding skin incision. And part of the reason for that is because we believe, and, and in truth, every one of us that's on this call and the institutions that we're at all have protocols for making sure that somewhere along the line, a patient gets at least one dose of beta blocker within 24 hours to satisfy the, the basic requirement that we have set up within the data set and the quality measurement uh, and so that, you know, that's what drives, we think that's what drives the, the national average to well over 90% um, of beta blocker use. Uh, but we think that that's not physiologically giving us the benefit of beta blockade, even though, frankly, we all do it. Uh, and, and so this is what we're trying to discern. And so as you go to fill this out, you shouldn't look at this as, you know, us saying, aha, we knew you were doing that. Uh, this is what we're trying to learn. Um, you know, to what degree are patients who are, quote, you know, recorded in the data set as on beta blocker, 
really not on beta blocker, but have given been given just a single dose. And is that in some way responsible for the discrepancy in outcomes that we've been seeing through some of the more recent papers? It, it's not intended to be a punishment or to be able to say you've been cheating. You haven't been. Uh, we just want to get the best information uh, that we can in total to really look at this because the data set as it is now has a, a query for more than two weeks and within 24 hours. And we don't really know how many patients are truly beta blocked um, because of the way we've, we have set it up in the past. I hope that, it, it, I'm not sure if I made that clear, but if I didn't, I, I can try again. I think that was helpful, Dr. Payon. Thank you very much. Okay, and then we get down. So again, remember these fields are only gonna open. We have to build it out this way so we can see all of the parent-child relationships when doing um, the data specifications for the um, for vendors if they want to build the form for us. When you actually use this form, you would skip over all of these uh, questions if they're not relevant. The next uh, set of next set of questions is the post-operative beta blocker. This is just the first beta blocker given between OR exit time and discharge, and the name of the beta blocker, the dose, route, and time. And then um, we get into the last set of questions, which is, did the patient experience AFib from OR exit to discharge? And we're defining this in the training manual as any patient that was not in AFib at the time of OR entry, and the same as we collect post-operative AFib as a complication. Um, and if they did experience AFib from OR exit to discharge, was the patient was it after OR exit or was the patient in AFib at the time of OR exit? And then the date of first documented. We don't want the time, just the date documented. And then if amiodarone was administered any time during the hospital course, if it was, was it prophylactically for treatment of AFib or rhythm other than AFib unknown? And then the date and time of the first and last dose amiodarone was given um, during the hospital course. Um, so it's, it seems like it's, it's a lot of questions, but when you um, condense it down, and I'm gonna show you now, when you condense this down into the red cap form, um, it's actually not, it's actually not that uh, not too bad. So hopefully, let me see if I can pull it up here. One second. Let me just go to my. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. One second while I pull it up. I'm working on it. One second. Sorry, everybody. I have not, I'm having a difficult time finding the link, but I know I just had it. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Sorry about that. So um, the link that'll be posted in the training manual, whoopsie, will be this uh, red cap link. And when you click on it, it'll open up to this page. Uh, the first four questions, similar to what the paper data collection form look like is here. And you would just put in the appropriate um, participant ID, patient ID, record ID, and then date of surgery. When you enter that in, 
uh, you'll get these questions. So number of home beta blockers, um, let's just say the patient was on one, the name of the first home beta blocker, the dose, and we're entering these in milligrams, the route and the frequency. And then it goes down to the next question, name of beta blocker given from hospital arrival up to 24 hours prior to skin incision start time. Well, let's say my patient um, came in the morning of surgery, so I don't have this information uh, because they were not in the hospital uh, during this time. And I think I'm saying that right. Uh, is this correct? So say that, you know, the patient, um, Dr. Payone and Dr. Kurtai, Dr. Shahan, the patient comes in the morning of surgery. I'm not collecting the home dose here because that's already collected. So I'm just, uh, I would answer that none was given here for this up to 24 hours prior to skin incision start time if the patient was not in the hospital during that time. That's true, Carol, per the training manual and the definition. Okay, thank you. So uh, my patient was just admitted in the morning coming in for an elective procedure. We're gonna, I'm gonna answer not given contraindicated or unknown for this um, time frame since they were not in the hospital during that time frame. And then I'm going to answer this dose received within 24 hours preceding, preceding skin inches and start time. This is the uh, most important questions. How many doses um, did the patient give? My pa patient was just given one dose in the morning time. And I will answer that information. I don't know if my dose, I think my doses are right, but I'm just going to answer that as they received it today um, at six o'clock in the morning. Oh. You have to go into that little clock and use that, that formatting in there. Okay. And then um, dose that was given the same in milligrams, the route, it was oral. And only dose, was this the only dose? I'm just going to verify in the, um, if I find anything in the anesthesia record or in the MAR that's, that identifies to me. Another dose was given, I would go correct my first answer. I do not find anything, so I am going to say yes. And then I get the name of beta blocker between OR exit and discharge. Patient remained on the same medication. Nothing really changed. This is the first beta blocker given. Um, they got out of surgery today and I gave it to them. Uh, we'll, we'll just say I gave it to them now. I can't um, post this. Of course, they're not gonna probably receive an oral beta blocker right after cabbage surgery, but uh, just for demonstration purposes. And then patient experience AFib from OR discharge. Um, we're just gonna pretend here. And uh, my patient did, it was after OR exit. So I would just fill in, um, we noticed it today. And patient um, did receive amiodarone. It was for treatment of AFib now. And I'll just say now, just for purposes of demonstration. And then um, that would be it. I know I'm making it sound simple, but I think that covers all of the questions. Um, so you only see the questions that are, are specific uh, to your to your situ patient situation. Um, I'm going to go through questions. I think I covered everything on um, on the review of that. Melinda, do you have anything to add or? No, I think we have lots of questions and we'll be able to um, address a lot of issues just with the questions as I've been looking through the 48 questions that we have now. Oh, 49 <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, they're coming in. Okay, no problem. Um, and then there's questions in here about the AQO Hot Topics webinar link. Emily's, I think, checking on those and I'll be reaching out to you um, yeah. with information. And I just, yeah, oh yeah. And I just want to mention if you didn't attend AQO, it's for attendees. So if, if you were looking for a link and you did not attend AQO, um, and then you, it's, you're still able to register for that content if you want. And then until December the 14th, um, and then you would have access to the webinar as well. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Amy, you're welcome for the longer harvest windows. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Jane Han, if Jane's still on, no. Uh, Emily, do you know if the invoices have been mailed out yet for STS? They're coming. Um, if they haven't been, they should be soon. Yeah, I'm not sure. I agree. Okay. Probably soon. Um, if we're able to, if we're able to listen to hot, if we're not able to join hot topics, we'll be able to uh, listen to the recording and you will be able to listen to the recording. It will be available to attendees uh, from AQO. We'll send out the recording to those, to those folks. Uh, you're welcome, Vicki. Cardiologists disagree that they should be on beta blockers pre-op if no MI occurred. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks for that. Um, any update on when the new frailty scale will go into effect? I do have an update on that. Um, more to come. The January webinar will be, no, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> February okay. webinar. Um, Why don't we February... talk a little bit about. What's that? We're going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow too, right? AQO Hot Topics. We are. We're going to talk about that in Hot Topics, and we also will be also addressing it on our monthly webinar uh, February 7th. Um, the executive summary for ACSD Pamela is asking about, um, we will have an announcement at AQO Hot Topics, and um, we're expecting to see that released uh, very this weekend. We'll have a, a preview of it on the Hot Topics webinar tomorrow, and then um, notification will be sent out um, regarding the release of that this weekend. It's due out this weekend, December 9th. Will the red cap slides be available to share with our surgeons? Yes, these will be posted. They actually were already posted. I think we did this webinar, Melinda, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we did this the beginning of November. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, it's been a couple months ago. Um, yeah, I think we did this webinar the beginning of November and these uh, slides are also available. It's October. Oh, beginning of October, sometime in October. Um, these slides are available there as well, but these will be posted. Uh, this webinar will also be posted within the next week or so. Um, the, beta block, Badger, the beta blocker project is to start with cardiac surgeries performed January 1st, 2024 and later. Yes, that's correct, Suzanne, thank you. How will we get our data back? Also, how will we be able to benchmark data to compare with other similar hospitals? We don't have anything to benchmark uh, right to now with other similar hospitals. Uh, I can assume pretty, pretty with, uh, with pretty good certainty that um, manuscripts will be coming out of this to present the data uh, once we get, get it in um, after the year of running this project. And to get your data back, more information will come on that, Dave. I just have to uh, work out the logistics of operationalizing it with our research center team. Um, so more to come on, on that. I'll discuss it on upcoming webinars. Which vendors are you working with? We will be reaching out to all vendors and whomever want, whichever vendor wants to help us with that or help uh, wants to do this will be given the data specs and software specs to do it. So or we're reaching with all of our vendors. Uh, Carol, do you might want to point out that it's voluntary for the vendors. So it's not yes. required for the vendors to point to, uh, to incorporate these fields. Great point, Paul, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um, vendors, we're not asking the vendors, or we're not telling the vendors they have to do this. We had vendors reach out to us that said they would um, be willing to build these fields into their vendor software um, to allow sites to easily abstract this data instead of having going into the red cap form. Um, it's completely voluntary for the vendors to do this and they would be doing it of, of their own free, uh, good free will. <laughs> so uh, we will not have any type of certification process for it since it's not um, connected to version 4.20 within the vendor software and we'll be running it for a year. So. Uh, we have a we'll be planning a call with the vendors in January. All vendors are invited to those calls and we'll be discussing it with them uh, further. Did I do good, Paul? Yep, sounded good. Thank you. Okay. Uh-huh. Are we clarifying patients we put in not just days of surgery, but days prior? Are we clarifying patients we put on beta blocker 
Not just day of surgery, but days prior. Yes, that's right, Tony. It's day, days prior. We're looking at... Um, we're looking at you know, hospital arrival up to 24 hours prior and then the 24 hours prior. Um, amiodarone is any time during the hospitalization. So if the patient's uh, prescribed amiodarone, we just want to know the first dose and the last dose the patient received. Why mention of new AFib? It shouldn't be there, wherever it is. <laughs> Maybe we forgot to take one of those new uh, out. Thanks, Hannah. I, know, I thought we got it. I thought we got it, but maybe we didn't. <laughs> I don't see it, but thanks, Hannah. Um, can this form be sent out to all participants prior to January? I'm planning to, Beth, I'm planning to post this on the website uh, later this week. So you can pull it down from the website. It'll be underneath version 4.20. How will we? How will this be accessible for DDE? You'll have the red cap form, Mary. So you'll need to, um, DDE users will be asked um, to use the red cap form to enter in this data. Again, this is, um, IQVIA will not be building these fields in for direct data entry users. Are the patient ID and record ID the same number? No, they're two different numbers. So the patient ID is the number your patient is assigned with in your vendor software. And then the record ID are specific to each case, uh, each procedure that the patient has within your vendor software. They're both assigned by your vendor or by IQVIA if for direct data entry users, and they're different numbers. I think we have examples of them within the training supplement that we have. And I don't know how much time we have. Oh, I guess we're at time already, aren't we? I didn't realize we were at time. Um, well, we have examples, Sarah, in the training manual. For patient ID, can you place a V so people know which number to use there? Yeah, we sure can, Robin. And we have that in the training manual too. Yeah. Um, Dustin, I'm curious about the accuracy of the post-operative AFib data that's been collected over the years. The following coding instructions for 694D5 to provide explicit duration requirements for coding yes to this, requiring very close communication between the post-operative care team and the abstractor. Has this sequence been audited by STS? Indicate whether the patient experienced AFib or A-flutter, AFib A-flutter after OR exit that lasted longer than one hour or lasts longer than one hour, but requires medical procedural intervention. And I think uh, part of what's missing from here, Dustin, is the part about excluding patients who were in AFib at the time of OR entry. Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure I would have to check our audited. No, I think this is audited quite often, Carol. Yeah, I would, I would have to check for sure. I thought that we did audit it I would have to check for sure. It's not in our major composite endpoints. Um, so I don't know that we focused on this one, but I thought that we were auditing it. Uh, but maybe Melinda or Emily, you could check our audited variable list to see if that one's audited. Will we do this for all first time cabbage patients? And I think we are looking at um, uh, Dr. Payone or Dr. Kurtai. Are we looking, do we want emergent, emergent, a salvage? Um, is there any requirements on the type of patients they're collecting this on? Currently our choices are elective, urgent, emergent, salvage. Let's see. I, I'm not sure, frankly, that we've specifically addressed that. Uh, the number of emergent and certainly salvage cases is pretty small. Uh, we'd certainly want to collect all elective and urgent cases. Um, I, I don't have a problem if we include the others, but I guess we would have to come to a decision about that. Uh, I know David and uh, Miklos are on the call still. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I would, if possible, collect information about those patients too, and then subsequently uh, at the analytical phase, we can always exclude those patients from the study, but um, sometimes there is a potential misclassification, uh, even if it's small, some of these patients, whether urgent or emergent. So maybe just, just 
uh, let's collect um, across the board that information and then, as I said, subsequently deal with it when we get to the analysis. I agree with that, I think so. Okay, sounds good, thank you. That, that keeps it straightforward. Will, yes, um, prior webinar mentioned talking to vendors regarding cost of abstraction. I can tell you, Ella, of the vendors that I talked to, um, there was no going to be no cost for doing this to their participants and that um, these vendors reached out to me. They were very unhappy that that was said during the webinar regarding additional costs coming uh, from their uh, companies. So I, I'm just going to be careful in addressing this, saying that you'll need to reach out to your vendors regarding this. Uh, my understanding is that the vendors who I have spoken with said that there would be no additional cost to their um, users for this. So um, how about if the patient arrives within 24 hours or surgery skin incision? I think I answered this one. Uh, so you would just, yes, there's an uh, option to code those uh, uh, contraindicated unknown or NA. If a patient is elective, do we attempt to capture the dose given in the last 24 hours? You're just going to capture up according, we do capture the dose given within the last one second here, within uh, 24 hours preceding skin incision start time. So we'll be capturing uh, that dose. How many pages is this voluntary form six? Um, depends, you know, we get these kinds of questions, Heather, it makes it seem like these forms are very long, but when you actually condense it down and uh, be realistic about what we're collecting, most patients that you're collecting these on are gonna have one home medication. So you'll only see this first five questions. Um, most patients will probably have only one medication here, if any, if they're um, not elective cases admitted the morning of surgery. Um, most of those patients who are elective, you will not even fill out this section, but those who are not elective um, that are in the hospital for urgent reasons or emergent, you'll have to capture the one medication here and then the number of doses preceding skin incision start time within 24 hours. Typically, it's either going to be one or two doses. Very unusual for three or four doses. So when we talk about this, we'll probably break it down to a two-page form, a realistic two-page form. Uh, sometimes it may go over two pages, but uh, yes. What if beta blocker is at home medication and anesthesia states beta blocker given within 24 hours? How do we document? document the time. So I think this, um, I'll let Melinda take this one because I think we've probably clarified this within the training manual already. Well, we haven't clarified a time because we haven't, we don't ask for a time. This field asks for a time. So I need to think about that and I'm going to make the note in um, my little training manual right now so I can think about that. Melinda, feel free to reach out and happy to help to weigh in once you have had a chance to kind of review the text uh, for the portion of the training manual. Okay. Yeah, it may be that we, I don't know. Let me think about how to do that. It's a good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Every time somebody submits a new question, it goes down to the bottom. I'm sorry. I'm I'm seeing questions come in or statements come in that this is many, many more fields. I think it's just built out a little bit differently so we can see everything. I don't think it's much more information than what we presented in October, um, but um, thank you for that feedback. The time expected to complete this form. Um, I just completed that red cap form. Um, I didn't wasn't looking into the EHRs, but assuming I'm doing this at the same time as completing the medication fields, um, I would be using my uh, my medication, my MAR to be completing that section. And I would also be answering questions related to this section. It's probably only going to take you maybe less than five minutes, I would say, uh, per case to get this in. You probably will be able to complete it in a couple minutes. Um, if everything is right there in your medication um, reconciliation forms. So if the patient received a one-time dose of beta blocker, then the rest of the questions would not be answered. That's right, Debbie. 
and that you wouldn't even see, you won't even see them. Is the OR exit time same as anesthesia end time? We no longer collect anesthesia end time in the database, so it's um, OR exit time is the field we collect in the database. IV infusion beta blockers, we do have those. Uh, we do have IV infusion as the route. You can choose that. And I, um, Melinda, how are we addressing the milligrams for IV infusions? Well, I guess it depends on how the IV infusion is given. So we have instructions to convert to milligrams, um, depending on the way that infusion is given um, currently. That's, that's how we've addressed it. it. It would be difficult to come up with a specific dose if someone's on just an IV infusion, for instance, ongoing of Esmolol. Um, I, I'm not sure how we're going to figure out how many milligrams they've gotten. And I'm not sure we want to ask the data managers to have to figure out how long they've been on it, what the rate is, and calculate some dosage. So we may have to figure out an answer to that question. Although that's, uh, I think, a little less, considerably less common. Is it not, uh, Miklos? Is that something you often yeah. do? Yeah. No, we don't often do that. And if Epic is used, for instance, Epic is basically can give you the cumulative dose over uh, the period of uh, specific care, such as the intraoperative phase of care or over a period of 24 hours. So that's a possibility. But again, I don't think so. We're going to encounter a lot of patients on uh, regular esmolol um, infusions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Amiodarone protocols are for five to seven days pre-op. Would you be capturing this? Yeah, so it's any protocol, anytime the patient's on amiodarone, uh, we're looking for that first dose and the last dose given during the hospital course. And the reason for the initial administration of amiodarone. So if the patient, um, the initial administration reason was prophylactically, then we'll want to see that prophylactically. We we do not need to identify within this field if the patient converted to our um, experienced AFib because we're capturing it up here of the AFib. So we don't need to have a multiple choice question down here. Um, why ask if the patient was in the AFib at the time of OR or experienced post-op AFib, but both questions are captured in the standard data collection form. It's a good question, Molly. Uh, those questions are not captured. We're not asking those exact questions here and they're not exactly captured that way. So. Uh, what we're asking here is if the patient experienced AFib from OR exit to discharge. Um, I had thought the same thing, but actually what we're capturing is um, the that AFib field. Melinda, did you want to take this one? Well, actually what we're capturing there, my interpretation is, yes, this patient did have AFib from OR exit discharge, but they were in AFib at at the time of OR exit. So you can you can identify patients that came out of the OR in AFib versus the patients that came out of the OR in sinus rhythm and then went into AFib. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the at time of OR part of a part of the question, Molly, I think what we you know, we ask if the patients are in AFib um, at OR entry within the standard data collection form. Uh, I think what Melinda, you said that we're looking at patients who go into AFib at the, within the OR, not who are in AFib at the time of OR entry. Yeah, these are people who are coming out in AFib. So they may not be the same group of people, Molly, that went in with AFib, because you know, sometimes people develop AFib in the OR. So I think that's why we have that question there. Yeah, so um, Carly, good question. A lot of, uh, thank you, Melinda. A lot of questions seem built for non-elective cases. Well, we had to consider everything in building this form. But that's why it's so um, complete because we, do, we don't wanna just focus on, on one group of patients. We had to be as inclusive as possible to make sure we get, um, we get a good sense of what's going on at sites regarding these questions. So we had to be very thoughtful in that. Um, for the elective patients, for the, patient where it says, you know, within, I'm sorry, where did it go? 
it's these questions, this one set of questions up here. Sorry for the scrolling. Um, for good Lord, the set hospital arrival up to 24 hours for your elective cases that are coming in the morning of surgery. You're just going to answer not given, contraindicated or unknown. We'll make sure that's in the training manual. And then you won't have these set of questions. Typically, those patients are going to be given one dose of beta blockers uh, in the morning of surgery, and you'll just capture the one dose here. Um, how much additional time does STS estimate for abstractors to complete abstraction of this information? I think, um, Diane, for standard typical cases that we see most elective or urgent um, patient, most patients coming in morning of surgery, we're probably going to spend maybe three to five minutes filling out this form for those very typical patients. Um, everything's going to hopefully be right inside the MAR. Just ask that you check the, um, the anesthesia form. Um, documentation for that any medications given right before skin incision start time um, you'll probably see those mostly you know just check your your uh, anesthesia records but hopefully it only takes a few seconds otherwise i think these are all going to be right in the mar you're going to have all of this i mean these are dictated together you can see the time that they were given you see the dose that was given you see the route that was given because it's all part of the order and it all transfers over to the mar so all of this information is contained together um, and you'll be able to pull that out pretty quickly the um to enter it into red cap I, honestly i think this any any typical patient you shouldn't be able to do this within less than five minutes and um, once you go submit the data into REDCap, can you go back and revise it? You cannot go back into, cannot go back and revise it. You have to reach out um, to someone at STS and we'll provide that information in the training manual. We're probably gonna manage it right through our um, help desk, but we have to, uh, we have to come up with that plan still. Our elective patients are given beta block in the morning of surgery if they did not take the dose prior to admit yet. So you would just capture that in the dose given within 24 hours prior to prior to skin incision start time. Would the same beta blocker, but with changing dosage, be collected as an additional beta blocker? Uh, you'd have to send that, probably send that question in. Tony, unless Melinda, you want to take that. I'm sorry, I was typing about the last thing. Okay. Would the same beta blocker, but with changing dosage, be collected as an additional beta blocker? I think that I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Is that the when you're giving the four doses or the first dose or the second dose? I would think that physicians would want to know if the dosage was different. Well, on the queries that we ask for the information on multiple doses, we have that information specifically to each dose. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I certainly wouldn't categorize it as an additional beta blocker. It's just a different dose. Right. I agree. Yeah, we're, we're collecting the four doses given. So it would be, so say the first one, you know, five, five of metoprolol was given. You'll collect that. And then for some reason, they changed the dose and they gave a second dose. You would capture that as the second beta blocker given. Did I sum it up right? I, I think so. With the correct dose that was given for that one. Um, administration is asking how much additional time. So I honestly think if for a typical patient, this is gonna take you less than five minutes to do. What if a patient arrives in the morning of surgery for surgery, took their home beta blocker, and so a beta blocker was not given at the hospital if this is charted? So what this is asking is admission. Oh, hold on. It's the first beta blocker given within 24 hours preceding, preceding skin incision time. This includes home beta blocker. So you're going to, um, this is not just at the hospital. You're going to collect any beta blocker that was given within the 24 hours. Um, what if a patient is given a beta blocker by more than one route in the time frame from OR exit to discharge? From OR exit to discharge, you're just collecting the first beta blocker given um, after OR, OR exit time. So it's the very first one, and you collect whatever um, dose, whatever medication, 
the dose, the route, and the time that that beta blocker, first beta blocker was given after OR exit time. Would it be a lot less work to do a retrospective study on first time cabbage patients that developed AFib? We still need the information, Catherine. Um, we don't have this information. We need to understand um, this better. That's why we're asking um, these questions. And it's a quality improvement project to address our current um, recommendations to ensure that we're, patients uh, are receiving the best high quality care possible. Don't usually have time and dose of beta blocker before they come into the hospital. How, Melinda, isn't that a requirement to code the within 24 hours or how does that work now? Well, we have some language if, if there's specifically anesthesia documents that it like, validated with the patient was given within 24 hours of decision, you've got no um, other indication that contradicts that validation from anesthesia with the provider then you can use that if the patient was on a home beta block, right? So there's a lot of really strict strict um, things that have to go into place to prove that. Um, that's the question we had before. We need to figure out how we're going to do that. And it may, I really wish we had like a little button that says uh, time unavailable or dose unavailable for that. And that, maybe that's something we need to talk to Nikki about. Um, just brings that. I don't think it's required though. If you answer that, I don't think we're requiring. You could leave only... it. You could put, you could yeah. put unknown. We have unknown. We don't know. Well, you, and you can um, leave the other information blank because I think we tried to think about that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for that's for the home beta blocker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we have unknown, and then you could just leave, you know, what you have here blank, or you can code unknown. Um, if you know that they received it, you just don't know when they received it uh, exactly or how often they were taking it. Um, hopefully that information is available, but I, I don't think we put any requirements on these fields to have to be complete. So um, do we have a specific definition to code post-op AFib? It's the same one in the training manual. Oh, yes, we do. Sequence 6945 in the training manual. And then how will we capture IV beta blockers? Uh, the, the route is, is captured there. And I think we're going to address how to capture the um, dosage or the amount given in the training manual. For the red cap form, STS is meeting with vendors in January. Do we go back and enter via vendor tool once ready or what should we do at first? I would enter, uh, Cindy, I would enter into red cap first. Um, if you want to stay current with your data, I would enter into red cap first for the, and then once the vendor tool becomes available, then you can switch over to the vendors. Um, and that should be perfectly fine to do it that way. Um, in the standard med rec, only timing of last dose is documented. Uh, in the med rec, in your MAR, in your patient um, medication, I think this is a home rec, a home med rec, I think is what Susan's referring to, oh. which is what, which is what we would need. We, we, we only, for home beta block, if that's what you're talking about, Susan, we're only asking for the name of the home beta blocker, the dose of it, the route of it, and the frequency. Yeah, we're not asking um, when it was given. But if that's the only, I mean, if that's what she's talking about. Susan, maybe you could clarify that so we understand what you're saying. When will the training manual be available for this? It will be this part. It's a. It's almost available now. I think it's pretty good to go. But we are planning. Uh, Melinda's going to add it into the January update. I think you'll yeah. probably have that out. Like, well, I've got some things to work on now to work through. So. This okay. is good that we have all these questions coming in so we can try to address them up front. Can we see the beta blocker collection form on the website for decision report? And I'll post the um, 
the data collection form, the paper data collection form in this Word document on the website by the end of the week. But I think we have to be really mindful of the um, reality of our patients that you know, pay attention to the parent-child relationships. We don't want to show surgeons a six-page form and say SCS is asking us to fill all this out when um, in reality it's going to be more like two pages. So um, just be mindful of that too. Um, this starts with January 1st surgeries, but meeting with vendors in January after go live. Why the need to begin January 1st? Why the need to begin January 1st if you're asking vendors to build, consider building? We're starting January 1st because we, we want to have, um, we need to get this project started sooner than later. And um, January 1st is this, uh, after January 1st is as soon as we had time on all of our schedules to get a meeting with the vendors, which we're working on scheduling. If our vendors are building this in their software, do we still enter the data in REDCap? Um, enter the data in REDCap until um, it is available, oops, until, until it is available within your vendor software. Um, do we need to notify you prior to January if we are going to participate? You don't. You do not need to notify me if you're um, planning to participate. We just ask that if you do participate, um, that your site's consistent in entering your um, isolated cabbage first-time cases. To clarify, RedCap form will be used when vendors elect not to change their platform. Uh, REDCap form is to be used at the start of this project, and then vendors who do elect to change their platforms will notify their users. We'll ask them to notify their users um, when it uh, with their plan for rollout on that. Uh, the vendors I had spoken to said that this would only take them, you know, a short time to build, and it didn't seem um, too complicated. It doesn't connect into the version 4.20 form, which require will not require any type of certification on it. Um, and it's just uh, parent-child relationships that they have to build in. So hopefully, uh, it will be it will be pretty quick in January. And we're very thankful that the vendors have offered to help us do this. Are we clarifying those who had AFib prior to surgery? That those AFib patients prior to surgery are collected in the um, recent remote section for the um, the arrhythmias or dysrhythmia sections, and then we capture specifically patients. And I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Uh, my interpretation uh, of that in question, and I could be wrong, is that if your patient goes into the OR and AFib, is are we are we still wanting to collect? add on those patients that's a question that comes to my mind the patients enters the has afib enters the or and afib is this a patient we, we want to do this on but i don't think we really talked about that well we want to know if the patient went into afib in the or no these are for patients that currently go into the or in afib um, oh, I see what you're saying. I don't. You I, yeah, I don't know about that. We, I, think I don't know either. We have to kind surgeon. of talk to the surgeons about that because yeah, I don't want to give the wrong answer on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, is uh, oh, do we fill out both forms? The first one reviewed and the red cap. No, it's just the the red cap form is the form you'll fill out. This um, paper data collection form is just to show you um, how the questions are laid out. What happens when you answer things certain ways, what you'll see. Uh, the red cap form is the form that you'll be filling out. Now it's up to you if you want to collect these cases on the paper forms and then enter them all into red cap whenever, you know, wh whatever process works good for you, you can certainly do that. Um, but the, the main thing that needs to be filled out is the red cap form. Is this to be filled out for all first surgery isolated cabbages? This would include if they failed the measure. Yes, we, we want to know on all first surgery isolated cabbage patients, um, including if they failed the 24 hour beta blocker um, measure, measurement requirement, measure requirement. 
will you give written instructions? Yes, Sherry, we'll give written instructions. It will be in the training manual, and we'll go over that in a webinar in January or early February. At the beginning of the webinar, we'll go over that quickly to show you where that's at. And we're really hoping we get good turnout. Uh, you're welcome, Mary. We're really hoping we get good turnout with this. Um, we may be able to end the project later. We just have to have some good, or earlier, we just have to have some good counts. And um, this is the group that I think we'll be able to get get that accomplished in. The training manual, uh, Melinda's gonna make some tweaks on the training manual, but usually she has it posted pretty, um, or usually it's earlier than the month it comes out. Don't you think? I mean, usually it's due in January, but usually you have it out the week or two before, usually a week before. January well, this, first. it's probably gonna it's probably gonna be posted somewhere around the 29th. Okay. Based, um, so, on, based on Christmas and holidays and all that stuff. That's yeah. probably where it's gonna play in. Do you have a few more minutes? Mm-hmm. Okay. To try to get through the as many questions as we can. So it won't be possible to add this to the vendor as we are collecting as we have to collect the case, then run a report to find out the patient and record numbers. No, uh, but these, the patient number, the patient ID and the record ID, these are populated. They should be right on your administrative screen for the patient you're entering in. So when you go to enter in a new patient within your vendor software, that patient is automatically assigned a record ID and a patient ID that's specific to your vendor software. And that would be the information that you're populating here. And if the vendor, and if the vendor is makes a form for you, that information will just, oh, just yeah. come right over. Sorry, uh, we're gonna ask the vendors to auto-populate these four fields since you're already they're already in your um, data collection form for this patient. So we're gonna ask them to just auto-populate so you don't have to re uh, re-enter these fields in. And I think maybe the confusion is the same way I was confused. They've got different sequence numbers than what's currently in the version 4.2, but that doesn't matter because the short name is the same. So this exact same information that's in the is in the main data collection form for patient ID, record ID, surgery date. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Sue Allen. We'll be Will we be able to access lists of our forms and data in RegCat for purposes of validation? Uh, yeah, I understand for monthly or quarterly reviews. We have to. We we will allow. Um, we'll we will be able to facilitate you having getting a copy of the data that you submit into the RegCat. I just don't know what that looks like right now. Um, we're probably going to do it by a per request basis, and we'll just download. Um, according to what participant ID you enter in, we'll just download the data that you submit into REDCap and send it over to you. Um, more to come on that, but if if I'm slow on providing a, um, if I'm slow to providing that um, answer to you, just reach out to me as we get the project started. Um, will an amendment to the DUA be needed to, to STS participants? For data going to the red cap, no, you do not. We do not need a separate DUA for the red cap form. Um, it's covered underneath the participant agreement with STS already as a third party. How would you know? Then there is a question that states elective, urgent. There is a question that we collect that elective urgent status in, and we would link that when we link the data from the IQBA warehouse with this data that's being collected in REDCap or at your vendor software if that, um, when that occurs. Uh, the, yeah, the link for the DCF, well, the D, data collection form will be posted. I'll hope to have that up by the end of the week, but the link to the, and that's just the paper DCF. It's gonna be the exact same as the REDCap form, Except on REDCap, you won't see all the parent-child relationships. Um, and that link will be posted in the January training manual. And Melinda said she'll, she plans to have that January training manual posted by December 29th. Are we able to indicate if a STEMI and STEMI type of emergent case in the REDCap form are just the elective first-time cabbages? Uh, it's for all first-time cabbages. 
we will know if it's a STEMI or NSTEMI when you provide us with the status on that patient. That's the right field, right, Melinda, status? Well, in the database, when you're filling out your normal case, Susan, you fill out sequence, I think it's 895, that's the CAD presentation, and then you fill out 1975, and that's your status of the patient. So all that information will be known because we will link the same um, patient ID and record ID and date of surgery to whatever you put into the red cap form. So we'll, we'll have all that information that you provided. Thank you. Um, hourly infusions would be difficult. I know, I've got to figure out what we're going to do with that. I agree. Uh, but if we're just talking about the, are we just talking about the- I think they're talking hour? about IV, IV, beta uh, IV beta blocker dosing and- um, Within 24 uh, hours preceding skin incision start time? Yeah, I think it's going to have to be with the, the, the amount. Uh, I mean, Mikos probably knows more about this because I, I don't see a lot of IV beta blockers being dosed. But I mean, I think, you know, depending on how they're dosed, it might be difficult to figure out the dose. So we need to work through that. Yeah, let's look through that. Let's look at that this Friday, Melinda, and see if we can. Since we include all status surgeries, elective, urgent, emergent, and salvage, will you be adding a status field to the form? No, the status field will just link it with the um, uh, status that you have provided in the 4.20.2 data collection form, the standard data collection form. Um, patients that have AFib on entry to OR, are we to exclude those patients on these forms? I don't think we've addressed that question, but I, I you know, it becomes a matter of do we want to know about what percent of patients, and we already have that information as to whether or not they're in preoperative AFib. So I, I would think if they're in chronic pre-op AFib, um, they they really, well, I, I you know what, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking occasionally patients come in in pre-op AFib and, you know, they you, you unclamp the aorta and, and they're in sinus rhythm. And then they go back into AFib. So uh, uh, we may have to think this through a little, a little better. Miklos, again, I'll ask if you, you, you're in the operating room a lot more than I am these days with that. What do you think? Is it just easier to capture all of the cabbages and say that they were in AFib pre-op and then there's really not much for the, to fill out other than to include them? Yeah, probably that's the easiest thing to do. So I, I, if to, just to be clear, I think what we're saying is we, we want to include all isolated primary cabbages uh, or, or pri isolated cabbage, uh, even if they're in AFib, uh, to avert having to wonder how many patients may have started in AFib, came out in sinus, went back into AFib, something along those lines. If they're in AFib to begin with, you, there's really not much to fill out here. That is okay. correct. Thank you. That sounds good, Dr. Payon. We'll, we'll do that. Okay, Melinda? All patients, first time yeah. cabbages. Okay, I missed the time for tomorrow's webinar. Um, tomorrow's webinar is the Hot Topics webinar for uh, AQO attendees, and it's gonna start uh, 10 o'clock Central Time to three o'clock Central Time. Are all of these fields mandatory and will be, and will we be unable to save the form if not entered? What if we don't know the time the patient took the dose at home. Um, so if you are gonna participate in, in this project, which is voluntary, um, the, we ask that all fields are completed to the best of your ability. Um, you can write it out on paper so you don't have to worry about saving it. Uh, and then you can enter it into the beta, the red cap form once you have it completed here. Uh, if we don't know the time the patient took the dose at home, then you're, um, we're not collecting that time, so. You should be good there. Is there any way the red cap link could be on the STS ACSD website versus having to open the training manual to access it? Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and I was that's a, a good question. And let me um, let me figure out how to do that with our marketing team. 
Yeah, Carol, when you're figuring that out, you might want to think about the valve red cap link too. Because um, yeah. we have those two now. I think both there would be helpful. Um, I thought you wanted all doses within the past 24 hours. Is that only for inpatients? Yeah, well, basically, those four doses would probably only apply to inpatients because if your same day admit comes in, at the most, you might give them one dose before their skin incision, but I doubt you'll give them any more than that. They're just coming in that we're in the surgery. That is correct, Melinda. It's highly unlikely uh, that you're going to end up giving more than just one one dose to those patients. But it doesn't mean that they're only that they haven't received additional beta blocker as part of their home medication. So that's the other thing to remember. They you would fill out the home medication part. You and then the 24 hours to skin incision would be whatever they received if they received anything after they arrived to the, uh, the OR suite, but they wouldn't have anything to put between hospital arrival up to 24 hours. Right. But the four dose question has to do with what's within the 24 hours. The only way we would know if a same day arrival patient had more than we would only really know what their home dose was we probably we wouldn't know how many doses they got at home before um do you see what i'm saying i think that's what susan's getting at um, for this question here first beta blocker given within 24 hours for patients who are admitted from home like say they come yeah. in at five o'clock yeah. and they're going to surgery at seven yeah, yeah, and then um, we wouldn't, we may not know the administration day and time. So I think that you would just leave that blank. Yeah. Um, you could fill out milligrams. And if it was oral likely, you'll be able to complete that. If not, you would just leave it blank. And if you're sure it was the only dose given, um, you would code yes. Again, just verify that it was. Um, do you have a place to document contraindicated for first beta blocker? Um, for this question, well, you would code none if uh, beta blocker was not given. We're capturing the contraindications within the standard data collection form. Uh, I missed your reply to this. Can you please address it again? How will we get our data back? Right, Dave. So I don't have that process in place yet uh, with our uh, research team, our analytics team to get the data back yet, but we will be able to do it. And um, I'll let you know when I figure out what that process looks like. It may just be per request. So sites that reach out that ask for their data back, um, it may be that way, or we'll have some type of web form um, or it'll go through our um, help desk. But we'll, we'll definitely um, work on that. Also, will we be able to get the benchmark data? Yeah, the same thing. I don't think we'll be, um, I did it. Uh, we won't be able to provide benchmark data back to sites. It will be, uh, likely many manuscripts or a manuscript will come out of this project addressing the findings on it or the non-findings on it. And um, that's where we'll see benchmarked information, I think. Um, and also something to consider um, as we move further on, I'll pass this information on to our surgeon, our physician leaders. For the vendors you said indicated there would be no charge for this the software vendors or the abstraction vendors? I heard from both types of companies, Beth. Could ask home, could ask home AFib, AFib at entry to OR to see who has an established AFib patient. Well, we captured this in the recent or remote. Don't, don't you think, Melinda? Do you agree with that? Well, we capture recent, we capture remote, we capture OR. AFib at OR entry currently. We don't specifically capture a patient that's in AFib at home necessarily. I mean, it could be included in that recent category. Do you see what I'm saying? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dave, yet yeah, there is a webinar tomorrow. It's the AQO Hot Topics webinar from 10 to 3 Central Time. When everything is done, can we share the information to our surgeons? Yeah, we'll be able to provide that. We should be able to provide your site information back to you, Grace. And I don't think you have to wait for the project to be done for the whole year. I think we could probably um, provide you back reports uh, maybe every harvest quarterly, you know, for harvest two, three, four, and one. So. Um, Dave, the if you so the, um, Grace will be able to provide that, but I have to come up with the method. Um, what's the best way to operationalize sites requesting their data back? Um, I thought there was a way to save a link to the Valve RedCat form to our desktops. If so, can this also be done with the Beta Blocker RedCat form? You can save the link to your desktop. Um, and I don't know what I did with my email. Let me see if I can find it quickly. That's not it. Um, so here's the link and I'll just click on it real quick. When you, um, I think save, it save it as a favorite, couldn't you? I mean, you can, but I think you can copy this. So I just highlighted the whole thing and then copied. And then I go to my desktop and I right click. And I thought there was a way to post, uh, paste it. Shortcut. Let me see if that works. I'm a I'm a Mac user, so when I get into Windows, it gets a little uh, a little hectic here. But let me. And I got I got stuff everywhere. I have no idea. Oh, it's here. New internet internet shortcut. And if I double click on it, my red cap form opened. So I'll do that again for you. And it opens right to the red cap form. So all I did was I highlighted the link, right clicked. This is on a Windows, copied it, went to my desktop, did new shortcut. And then under shortcut, I pasted the hyperlink and I put next. And then it made the shortcut for me. And this one was called the new shortcut. So um, I'm just going to, well, I don't know where it went. It's somewhere on my screen. I just can't see it right now. Um, but that's how you, I guess that's how you are able to do that. So that's a, a good point, Annette. Um, and we're almost out of questions. So hold on one second. Uh, should you be capturing if they had an epicardial maze with a cabbage? Well, we would do that in the normal data collection form, Kelly. Remember that we're going to link the existing version 4.2 with this form. Oh, no, I think this is. So uh, what about intracardiac mazes, though? So epicardial mazes will keep the case in the isolated cabbage category. But what about intracardiac cases? Dr. Payone, are you still on? Uh, I am, and I really don't think very many people are doing full intracardiac mazes with isolated cabbage, but uh, I, I think that takes it out of the isolated cabbage section, doesn't it? It, it does, does, yeah. It removes yeah. it to the other, so other then, category. Then, then you wouldn't you wouldn't need to do it because it's a, uh, all right, this is just for isolated cabbage. Okay, thank you. And then if they're doing an epicardial maze, actually, either way, they're already in AFib. Right, presumably. I don't I don't know anyone that's doing it. No one's going to do an, an intracardiac uh, maze procedure prophylactically. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was a couple questions for the hot topics link again. Uh, it's for HUO attendees so those folks who registered for AQO received the link to do it if for some reason you registered but did not receive the link um, please reach out to Emily Conrad and I'll put her email here Emily's gone for the day she's on her headed on her way home uh, but she will uh, be checking her emails when she gets home and um, tomorrow morning before the webinar starts um, anything else Melinda 
<laughs> I think I have enough to work on now. <laughs> no, I think we have enough to work on right now. <laughs> Thanks, I everybody. Think so. I think so, too. And uh, we'll hopefully see a, a big group of you tomorrow morning. Um, it's not too late to register for AQO. If, if you're interested in registering for AQO, um, haven't done so yet, um, you can join us tomorrow for the Hot Topics webinar. Um, to register for AQO, you just go to the STS.org page. Education. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think online. Calendar of events. I still have trouble with this new website. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, that's not going to work. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, it's STS under... National. I'm going to do this way. Research and data, STS National Database. And then if you scroll, I think this, I think it hates me. I think <laughs> I'm going to do that for data, for data managers. Yeah. I think it really hates me. There it is. Okay, so research and data for data managers, and then um, there it is. Advances in quality outcomes of data managers meeting, and to learn more. And this is where you would purchase if you are interested in it. Uh, so that's where you go uh, if you're interested. Okay. Otherwise, uh, for those who are going to participate, we'll see you in the morning. We have a great reason, a great show. And thank you so much, Dr. Payone. I think um, Dr. Kurtai probably had a um, jump off because he was likely scrubbed in. Oh, he's still there. Thank you, Dr. Kurtai. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm still here. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank no, you. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of you, uh, including the data managers, but uh, especially Carol and Melinda for yeah. doing all of this and uh, sitting through all of this and answering all 155 questions <laughs> from well over 400 people. So th this was a, a, a great meeting and we look forward to success with this project and thanks to everyone. Yeah, well, well we're going to do good with it. Absolutely. And um, thank you for, for all your support and helping us with it. Uh, so everybody, I hope you have a great rest of the night for those of you who will uh, will not be on the webinar tomorrow. I'm going to miss you, but uh, we'll see you next year. Um, happy, happy Hanukkah, happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, happy New Year's, and happy birthday to anybody celebrating their birthday on January 2nd, like me. And uh, I hope, <laughs> hint, hint, Melinda, January 2nd. Hey, my, bir my birthday is in four <laughs> years. Mine's like in uh, two weeks or less. It hint, is? Yeah, the 22nd. Well, Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> so happy birthday to anybody celebrating and um, hope you all have a happy, safe holiday season and um, stay warm and take care. Thanks again, everybody, and look forward to Thank seeing you. you tomorrow.